Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Chris Hayden. I'm the director of worship here at South Shore. It's my pleasure to welcome you to worship. And uh, before we begin, we actually have uh, a brief word from our staff parish team, or a portion of them. We would like to sit down or remain standing or come down front or I know there's somebody particularly who is interested in dancing in the service. And, uh, uh, you are welcome to do so. Uh, express worship in a way that God is calling you to do so. It's a safe and free place to do that. So, will you stand as you're able and we'll start with our call to worship. Hey, and as you're standing up, today is also our Pledge Sunday. Many of you received a letter in the mail this week and you are asked to bring in your pledge cards today. How many people forgot them? Okay, keep your hands up, we'll bring them to you. And, yeah, so they'll be, uh, seriously, if you need a pledge card today and you want to, and you're ready to have that in, you simply forgot it, uh, leave your hand up and our ushers will find you and bring one to you. Great, thank you. I'm um, sorry we had to stand, we got a little, we got thrown off on our rhythm this morning. Uh, if you are wondering, hey, I didn't get one of those letters, I don't know what you're talking about, um, our ushers will come around as well. They have a letter for you in the pledge card. If you haven't had time to pray about that or think about that, and you're like, ooh, I'm caught off guard, wait a week. Go home, talk about it, um, plan for that, ask God where, uh, where God is asking you to grow in your generosity. And you can bring it in next Sunday or mail it in or even email it into our church office. But it is important that we wrap it up, that we get these things in so that we can move ahead in our planning for our budget for next year and all the great things that uh, God is calling us to do in our community. So today is about being thankful. Um, and uh, we're going to look at a scripture that maybe puts a, a new idea in a new way in which we, we might respond to God um, more immediately than after the fact. You'll hear more about that in a bit. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading. I will begin and you respond with the words in white. The Lord be with you. Oh God, we come before you today with gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to share with each other and to give to each other. Gratitude for the example of Jesus who teaches us to love our neighbors. Thank you for the opportunity to expand our hearts, our communities, and our lives through your grace. Amen.
to the water where, where death seems certain, where fear is overwhelming, where risk is too much. Lord, will you call us to the edge of our faith in you and meet us there. Meet us in the darkness. Meet us in the fear. Give us assurance of your great mercy and your great grace. Lord, it is there, out of that place, that we commit and give back to you what you have given us. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. You call me out of deepest waters,
We come down to our time of offering as our ushers, uh, our worship support team comes forward. I want to remind you that uh, this Sunday is where we are, uh, as a church, committing to the to the year of what uh, each family will, uh, will give back to God. And if you've prayerfully considered that, and you have filled out that card and you're ready to do that, then you'll simply place them in the baskets as they come around. So I'll, I'll invite you to uh, join me as we ask for God's blessing.
and you haven't signed your kids up, simply one of the various things to go with the kids and sign in and get your handy dandy child care warrant or bracelet. So make sure that our kids are well cared for and we take excellent care, custodial care of your valuable resource, our next generation. Yes. You know, I will say that uh, last week we talked a lot about that and how are we going to respond to God and our responsibility in caring for the next generation and stopping this trend of fewer and fewer people being exposed to, to church as things, uh, as we move younger and younger. And we actually got a couple of new small group leaders out of that, so the guilt trip worked. And, uh, you know, that's what somebody said to me, and I'm like, it wasn't a guilt trip. Okay. Okay, Jesus. Come on. Let's start out. Um, that, you know, I was really excited to hear that there was energy and, and uh, passion about giving back in that way and seeing it as something that is valuable. Uh, today, we're talking about thankfulness, and, and that's one of the ways in which we look to improve our home, our place where we live, work, uh, play, worship, the people with whom we come into contact, that's our home. That as we grow in thankfulness and generosity, that helps us be better people. And as we think about thankfulness, and I thought about the folks who are sitting here, I don't think there's a single person that's going to come to church today who is out there going, yeah, I'm not a thankful person at all. I'm pretty much a grouch. I, they make comic strips about me. I'm a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a terrible person, and I'm just not thankful. I don't think we consider ourselves that. As I look out and see faces and, and engage you, generally, you're nice people. And you have a generous spirit about you. It's one of the reasons why you're drawn to this faith that is about generosity and about receiving God's grace and presence in your life. But sometimes the way in which we're thankful, well, maybe you're kind of like me. I appreciate all the stuff that God has given me, and, and I'm thankful for it, and, and I'm going to make sure that everything I need to do is going to be taken care of. You know, I make sure that I pay my, my mortgage, and, and I have enough food in the house, and that I can make, make my car payment, and I've got my entertainment stuff in there, I and mean, then I get to play golf two times a month. And I make sure that I have time to go to the movies and uh, do some other things. And then I've got the little nest egg and the plan for retirement. And now that I've got all of those things taken care of, now what can I be generous with? And give to the church. And to give to the Cub Scouts who stopped me walking in the, in the lows when we went to buy expensive popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Which you should do. And if you don't want the popcorn, just give me some money if you have it. So, because um, we love our scouting programs. Uh, and yet it doesn't sound all that strange. Well, of course, John, you have responsibilities and things you're supposed to do. And then you look at what, after your obligations are met, be generous with what's left over. That has become an okay thing for us to do. And yet scripture is very clear that that's backwards. That is not what we're supposed to do because that tells us something about who we believe God is. What it says is God needs our help to make sure we're taken care of. We need to take care of ourselves and then look to be thankful to God. The scripture today really illumines this for me. It's from the Gospel of Luke. It's the only place, the only gospel where this particular story is found. And uh, the message reads like this. It happened that he made his way toward Jerusalem, being Jesus. He crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. So he's out of town and he's walking between places. And as he entered this village, or is coming on the outside of the gates, ten men, all lepers, met him. Now, it doesn't, they may not have had exactly leprosy. But the point is, they had a skin condition that made them unclean. And when you were pronounced unclean, it meant you couldn't hang out with regular people. You had to go be banished outside the city gates. And until things cleared up, you couldn't come be with other people. One, because they were scared of the disease. And secondly... There was a belief at that time that because you were sinful or the sins of your family, that's why you had that condition. And so until you got things worked out between you and God, you shouldn't be back among the people. You with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now these ten folk kept their distance, but they raised their voices. And they called out, and I hear clearly, they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
Well, a couple things. One, they know it's who Jesus is, so word about who Jesus is has traveled to them, or they had met him before. One of the likely news of Jesus, the rabbi, had come their way. But they use the term master. Interchangeably, we translate also Lord. Now, this isn't Jesus, hey, neat guy who gives people stuff. <laughs> Jesus, guy who says words and people are healed. It is Jesus, master of me. Lord of me, master of all creation. Do you hear they not only know Jesus' name and know him as a rabbi, but they know his identity and his power. And they ask him for mercy because he is the one who has authority to give it. Very important. We have to recognize Jesus as having authority. So taking a good look at them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests, which is an odd thing kind of to say, but what that meant was to be reinstated into the community, you had to go upon healing and show yourself to the priest. They had to say, yes, you are certified, USDA certified, clean, <laughs> and you can now go about your business and re-enter society. And so they went. They were like, okay, now nothing had happened yet. Hey, Jesus, Lord, Master, have mercy upon us. Okay, go show yourselves to the priest. Okay, no healing yet, no nothing. They went. They were obedient to, to Jesus' command. Okay, I'll, I'll go. And as they're going, on their way, they became clean. How cool would that be? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just, hey, I'm sick, I'm not feeling good, or whatever. Go to McDonald's. Okay, and as you're walking to McDonald's, you get clean. You're not walking with a limp anymore. I don't know. Would you not freak out? Yes. Yes! <laughs> it's like, you know, you're walking and the snails are just, and your, your skin is becoming clean again. They'd be like, holy cow! <laughs> One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back. And he shouted his gratitude, glorifying God. And he kneeled at Jesus' feet and he was so grateful. And he couldn't thank him enough. And he was a Samaritan. I remember Samaritans and Jews didn't quite see eye to eye. They didn't get along. Kind of odd that the Samaritan was hanging out with Jews, but when you're unclean, you're unclean. And it was the outsider who turns and gives thanks to God. The other nine, I don't think they were bad people, probably. They were probably a lot like us. Okay, look, I'm getting clean. I need to go and make sure stuff's going to work out for me. I need to handle my business. I need to go and show the priest that I'm clean. I need to get okay. I can go see my family. I can kiss my friends. I can now touch people again. I, I need to let everybody know. I can Maybe I can get my job back. And then I'll go say thanks to Jesus. Do you hear? That's us. Let me pay my mortgage. Let me take care of my family. Let me have my car payment. Let me do these things. Then I'll look at being generous. Then I'll look at being thankful. It's not a bad thing. It's just not the best thing. So Jesus says, well, weren't there ten? Where are the other nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outside? And then he said to him, get up on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. And my guess is then he went and showed himself to his priests and re-entered society. But he received the extra blessing because he was thankful first. He didn't wait to make sure everything was going to be okay. He took it upon himself to go and let me take care of my business, God, and then I'll come back and be with you. It was immediate upon the blessing that, that came to him and to turn and give thanks for the circumstances that were there to do that first and foremost and trust God with all the other things. If I can seek first to come and and seek righteousness at the foot of Jesus, then all those other things will be added unto me. Does that sound familiar to you? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto me. But we think it's up to us, it's up to our work, it's up to our efforts, and really, it is, but not the way we think. It does take a decision for us to be thankful, to stop and to turn, and to give credit where credit is due, and to be wise. And trusting in God's providence, trusting in God's goodness, trusting in God's giving to us. In Romans, Paul 
warns us pretty sternly. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate, as people try to put a shroud over the truth. <clears throat> but the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes. There it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes, as such, can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mysteries of his divine being. In Methodist circles, we talk about this as first grace or preventing grace. It is God's first act. You see, we don't act first and turn to God. If it were up to us, we'd be off doing all manner of crazy things. You see, God pours his grace and mercy on us first and gives us the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. The ability to discern the eternal and the everlasting from the fleeting and the temporal. To recognize that which is holy and that which is profane. That is God's gift to us. It's what keeps us from walking headlong into trouble. But instead, the wise person sees it and avoids it. Are you sounding familiar to you if you were here in the last couple of weeks? This is God's gift to us. So there's no excuse of, well, I didn't know. Yeah, you do. And for those of you that are sitting here, ooh, you're hearing it today. <laughs> you know. We know what is good. We know what is right. Nobody has a good excuse because what happened was this, Paul continues. People knew perfectly well that when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. Now, when I read that this week, I didn't kind of get the whole, I didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him and silliness, but I did look at some of the places in my life and some of the seasons in my life right now and certainly in the past where there was confusion. I had no idea what direction to turn. I pretended that I knew. But I really didn't understand what life was all about. I see that clearly. And now the, the dots are connected. Why? Because I wasn't worshiping the way I was supposed to worship. I didn't have God in his place as Lord and Master. I knew his name, but I didn't recognize his title or his authority. And that was essential to our ten lepers being healed. Paul said just that. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. And the cheap figurine that I was buying was security. Being safe. If I can just set up my little castle, my little kingdom, and make sure all my needs are taken care of, I'll be safe. And then I can go serve God. I forgot that serving God is risky business. It means you have to go and put yourself out there. We think hospitality is punching cookies. And we're nice people. Hello, good morning this morning. How are you this morning? I'm good this morning. How are you this morning? It's a good morning. How about that weather? Oh, it's great weather this morning. It's a good morning. Would you like a cookie? Give it to that cookie. Would you like a coffee? Coffee would be great. Good morning this morning. Good morning. We're so nice. And, and you guys see, we all think, particularly folks who've been coming to this church for a while, who are all insiders, you think you're really friendly? You're scary. <laughs> Imagine walking in and having a hundred people coming up to you, shaking your hand, going, Hi, it's so good to see you this morning. <laughs> Would you like to get this morning? Yeah, okay, okay. You know? That's not hospitality. That's not risky. You know what's risky? Is seeing somebody and looking into their eyes and seeing who they really are, whether that's a person who is hurting, who is searching for something more, maybe a person who comes is full of the glory of God and is willing just to be in worship this morning and to recognize that and to affirm that in somebody, and to go up and say, wow, you're just so full of life this morning. I, I had a hard time getting out of bed. I am just glad to be in the presence of somebody who's feeling so thankful to God today. Or to see somebody who is hurting and notice the little tear in their eye and a little bit of fear. And you go up and say, what's your name? Tell me something about you. I really want to know, how are you feeling today? 
see, hospitality is not a punch and cookies. Although punch and cookies are a way to get toward hospitality. Hospitality is opening up the real you to be fully present for that real other person. And when that happens, then we're getting on about the business of God because that's not safe. <laughs> it's risky. It says, I share the living Christ whose heart beats in me. Though I am imperfect, I share that perfect love with you and I'm a safe place as you receive me. This is who we are. This is the mark of a hospitable church. And coffee and cookies make that easier to happen, but if we stop with good morning and here's your topic to go, we've missed the mark. Are you with me? This is who the church is called to be in the midst of people who are far from God. In the midst of people who, as they do their best to work out their place of safety, cannot find it. Or worse yet, they're completely safe and comfortable and wonder why they're miserable. We know. It's because first you have to recognize the name of Jesus. You must place him as master and lord of your life. And when stuff happens, give him thanks, whether it's good or bad. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this. We're not keeping this quiet, not in your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe. Do we? What we believe is that the one who raised up the master Jesus will just as certainly raise us up with you. Alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. This is who we are called to be. Every detail, even the painful ones, working to our advantage in God's glory. So that the grace, the first grace of knowing right from wrong, of knowing the capacity to even recognize that God exists, that that is reaching more and more people. And that that may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Not are you thankful people, are you nice people, are you generous people, are you overflowing with thanks? Are you overflowing with generosity? And is that bringing glory to God? I hope so. Because if you want to find contentment and purpose and deep felt joy, not happy. Happy's way overrated. But finding deep joy becomes with a thankful heart, a happy heart. That's the only place to start. Boy, that's some uh, veggie tales. I thank God for this day, for the sun and the sky, for my mom and my dad and my piece of apple pie, for the love that we share because he listens to our cares. That's why I say thanks every day. Because a thankful heart is a happy heart. I'm glad for what I have. That's an easy place to start. Are you with me? Yes. But isn't that true? If we could only be happy with what we have and turn it, even the difficult times, for glory and honor to God, how much more would we be content? And how much more would we be able to walk into the places that aren't safe, into a future that is not secure? But knowing who God is, and that in God, the final victory is won. It's over. The game is decided. The outcome is assured. Jesus Christ has swallowed death with victory. And those who believe in him will never die, but have everlasting life. <coughs> and that great life is not when our heart stops beating and the synapses in our brain stop firing, that life begins when you say yes to the master and claim him as such. That is when life begins. That is when everlasting happens. That is when the kingdom of God is bigger by one person and has the opportunity through its thankfulness and its generosity to impact the world. That is who we are called to be. So I pray that this morning, if you have come and your life is feeling perfect and in shape and all, good for you, are you overflowing with generosity to the master? Maybe you're at the place where you've been broken and hurting for a long time and, and you're just beginning to experience God's divine and miraculous work in your life and you're seeing things are getting better. 
Don't wait till it's perfect. Stop now and return to the master and say thank you and give glory to God. Or maybe you're a person who is in the midst of a deep trial, a season of your life where you are hurting and broken, and you're gathered together with other miserable people going, what am I going to do? I can't even go inside the city gates. Maybe it's time for you to turn, to recognize the Christ who stands in your midst, even in this moment who is represented by, the, by the, the grape juice and the bread that we will share in a moment, that that is his body, his blood, given for you, that you might come to know him as Lord and Master, and in doing so, be healed and be prepared to live a life of joy and of thankfulness, of generosity and of thankfulness overflowing. I could get on board with that. How about you? Jesus was having the Passover meal with his disciples. He had entered into Jerusalem, and he had told them several times what was going to happen, and they didn't get it. They didn't understand the sacrifice that the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Messiah was ready to make for them. But he gave to them and gives to us a sign of remembrance of just how far God is willing to go to reclaim his creation. He took bread, and after he had given thanks, huh, imagine that, gave thanks. He broke it. In the midst of facing the cross, he gave thanks. He knew that even that would be turned to God's glory. And he gave the bread to each of them and said, this is the body that's broken for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And every time that you eat, I want you to do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to each of them. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Shall we pray together? Pray and sustainer God, we don't come to your table trusting in our own ideas and our own righteousness and our own working out our, our own salvation on our own merits. We're not even worthy to gather up the crumbs underneath your table. So we do call you Lord and Master, and yet you prepare a seat at the table for us. You prepare a place for us. It's a great mystery. So God, for the places where we have fallen short, the places where we have forgotten to do what is right, and the places where we have chosen to do what is wrong, God, we're sorry. And we ask for your forgiveness, and we trust in your mercy and your grace. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine and make them for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That as we receive them, that we might be washed clean, that we might be made whole, that we might be sustained through the journey. And that with each breath, we would breathe in more of you and the Holy Spirit. And we would more and more lay over ourselves as a whole and living sacrifice unto you. As we come and receive with thanksgiving this representation of your life, death, and resurrection, may it nourish a thankful heart. May we start there being happy with what we have and expectant for what will come in your divine providence. Lord, be with us in these moments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. As our ushers come forward, the table in the United Methodist Church is open to any and all who seek to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member. You've been here for the very first time, and we'll invite you to come and receive. We'll come down the side aisles. There is hand sanitizer available if you would like it. Then you come and receive a gift of bread. It's good to come with your hands open and allow it to be placed into your hand. To see it as a gift, but that's what it is. God's gift to you. You may take that piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and receive the elements in that way. The kneeling rail is open if you'd like to kneel and pray. If you need someone to pray with you, simply raise a hand and one of the pastors or ministry candidates will come and be with you. If you would like to be served in your seats, raise a hand, and I'm sure will come to you. And if you need gluten-free products, you have it in the tray, and you don't have to take from the loaf.
to the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broken for you, that you might have newness of life, that ever hereafter that you would be forgiven the things that are past, and from here on find newness of life. May this be something that cleanses you and sustains you for the journey, brings you into wholeness, into joy, into purpose, into true thankfulness.
handing out our registration pads. And if uh, you're a guest with us today and would like to register your visit, you can find them fill out a brief sheet in whatever way is easiest to get in touch with you. If you've been here before, please sign the white side and give us any information you change. One other thing you might choose to do is that if something was said in the service today, you experienced something you'd like to talk further about with one of the staff and pastors, just write that down and we'll get back in touch with you this week. Secondly, maybe something in what was said today in your experience, you feel a call to do something about that, whether it's, yeah, I'll, I'll teach or I'm playing the band or tell me about that backpack ministry, but whatever it is, if you want to get involved in the life of the church, let us know and we will help you do that this week. You can be working and serving next Sunday morning. We would love to have you come and be part of that. Um, in a spirit of thankfulness, I do want to say thanks to Nick Gill, who was playing with us this morning. <laughs> Nick played with us in high school, and he went away and got a degree and broke up. So we're so glad that Nick's with us playing, and uh, thankful that we have folks like him and, and uh, Kayla Osborne as well, who's singing with us this morning. We're so glad that she's here. Um, so, spots are open. So, as well, look into the band. We'd be happy to help you as well as any other places. So, uh, it's a good day to be in worship. It's a good day to choose to be thankful. And it's a good day to sing praise and honor to the one we know as Jesus. And I pray more and more are allowing to be invited to be master of our lives. <coughs> I want to invite you to stand as you're able, and we're going to close with uh, a song that I hope will remind us of what we're giving to and what we're truly hopeful God will do with uh, our meager offering. Could we live like your grace is strong?
I hope that's something that we can believe. I know last week we had folk respond to the sermon by getting involved and, and serving, and, and I hope that today some of us will respond as well by thinking, rethinking our pledge to the church, our commitment to ministries for ourselves, worship, and small groups, and mission, as well as ordering our lives into for good and holy purpose. Um, yes, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and thank you for that, for having myself as well. Thank you for your generosity, for your kindness, for your cards, for your support. Um, but also, you know, thank you for me allowing me to be the pastor of this congregation. In the Methodist Church, we're reappointed year to year, and we never know whether we're going to get another year. And I've been thankful to have nine. This is the ninth, I think. Eight or nine. So, yeah, so it's a great, great time to be. I love being the pastor here, but you know, it's not always going to be that way. At some point, I'll be needed somewhere else, or the church will need someone else to take her to the next place. I don't know when that's going to be. But this isn't my church. This is God's church. You are son, Christ's sons and daughters, and this is where the heart is, and you will lead along with another, a new pastor to a new place. This thought in the midst of being thanked that I need to tell you how thankful I am to be appointed here at this time today, and at least until next July. So, thank you for being here. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, generosity, and a thankful heart.